Thank you. Right, I think we're gonna give it another minute to see people streaming. I think sometimes the sessions go over, so there's always that lag time. All right, why don't we get started and people will just come along as they come along, right? So hi everyone. In uh, this session, we're gonna be focusing on a very important topic, which is talking to kids and your loved ones about HD, specifically targeting to young people. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bonnie Hennig Trestman. Very good. Yeah, got it. Um, she is an author who has written multiple books about talking to kids with HD, and she's also the co-chair of the HDO's research committee, a research committee that I myself am very fortunate to be a part of under the leadership of Dr. Bonnie. All right. Great. So this will be a question and answer panel. So please type in your questions as they come along. We're aiming to make it really interactive, you know, anything that comes to mind when it comes to framing the conversation around talking to young adults and children about HD. And as people are doing that, just to kind of give you an idea of where I am, because I like to hear where people are, people who are presenting or people who are participating, where they're located. Uh, I am in the United States. I'm on the East Coast and considered South uh, in a, a state called Virginia. And if you have a map and you find Washington, D.C., we're really just kind of below there. So I'm about six hours from Washington, D.C. So it is uh, about 440 in the afternoon for me. So. Um, good afternoon to people, good evening, good morning for some, um, and hopefully we will have a conversation going. There's not going to be slides. This is really an hour just for you. All right. We already have uh, questions. So we can usually just okay. dive into it. Yeah. So the first question comes from Ashley, who asks, what would be your advice for talking to a large group of HD kids? Ashley, I think, does not have HD, but her family does or might have HD. Yeah, actually, that's a really good question. So I think that it's really important to um, to recognize that you know it's it, that talking to children doesn't have to be something scary. That's something that that we as adults kind of feel that this is something that would be worrisome or scary. And I think you know when you're talking about a large group, I don't know if that's your family or if that's multiple families. I think starting with one family and making sure that all the kids in that family do have some information. I do talk to a lot of people who tell me that maybe that there's one kid who worries or that they're just going to tell the older children. And what happens then is that there's a burden that's placed on, on one or maybe a couple of the children that doesn't necessarily have to be that way. It really is a question of um, uh, really just making sure that everyone has basic information. And of course, you know, I work with families that have multiple children or young, uh, young adults that have wide ranges in their ages. 
And I think that obviously a young child is gonna get information differently than an older teen or a young adult. However, if you provide all of this information, just the basics of how to talk to them about, you know, that we have Huntington's in this family, um, that that can be really helpful. Also, just because we have an hour and so many questions, there's lots of resources that are out there. So a good take home message for all of you is that you don't have to do this alone. Please do reach out, look on the HDO website, um, reach out to us as well. You can certainly reach out to me no matter where you are in the globe and I can walk you through some of these things. But I think it can be really helpful just to know that there are resources and you don't have to go this alone. So hopefully that answered that question. Cool, I think it's very important to you know, start talking to kids. And as a follow-up question, when do you think is the best age? I think this is a question you might get pretty often, right? Yeah, yeah. so the question I usually get is when is the right time, whether that's the age or what's going on in their lives. And you know what, any time is the right time. Even after I do conferences and, and I talk to large amounts of people, people will inevitably come up to me and say, I did it wrong. Uh, you know, I didn't tell them, I should have told them. And what I say to people is that you did the best job you could with the information you had at the time. Now that you went to a conference, even this is virtual conference, you can say to somebody, I got information about Huntington's disease and I know it's really important for me to share with you. Um, so it could really start as, as young as a child, just having that word HD or Huntington so that it normalizes for them. So it really is one of those that you can get very caught up in saying, oh, you know, my child worries or they're starting to go to school or make friends or they're starting with exams. It can go all the way up a lifetime where you can really make an excuse. So the best time uh, is- Dr. Bonnie, sorry to interrupt you. Just a second. Um, could you talk a bit slower? There's some feedback that you're talking too quickly. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I appreciate the, the feedback. Um, so really, it's very important to know that now, you know, any time is the right time. Um, and, and you can certainly get that information, uh, give that information to your loved one by just saying, I learned that it's really important for us to give this information to you. And that's what I want to do. So don't worry that you did something wrong. Just go with the information you have now. All right. I think uh, we're going to wait till a couple more questions come in. But so, sort of really framing the con conversation, what, how is the best way to approach it? What do you start off with? How do you initiate the conversation with a child who oftentimes have limited understanding about what HD really is? Right. And that's the key that because they have limited understanding, they don't really see this as something scary. So when you talk to a, um, a young child to be able to say, um, that uh, mommy or daddy has a um, has has an illness. Um, it's called Huntington's disease. We call it HD, and we're going to keep you informed of what that is. You you don't need to go into all the nitty gritties. You also don't want to have just one conversation. We heard lots of speakers talk about, including Jeff Carroll, say that he knew about HD, but then nobody talked about it. So you do this in multiple stages over a lot of time, then you can start having an open communication. So it really just has to be, um, you know, that, that somebody has a disease, it's called Huntington's disease. It's a disease that's part of the brain, you can't really see it. But when you talk to a child, even a young child, they might be able to see the differences of what that person with HD has compared to maybe their friends' families or somebody else in their family who doesn't have Huntington's disease. So you really need to take it down to the, the, the easy, tiny little steps. I always tell people it's like feeding a baby. You use a little spoon, you give a little bit of food. Same thing with, with young children. You give a little bit of information, see if they can swallow that, and then come back to a conversation about it. Got it. I think um, speaking from personal experience, you're right that in terms, in terms of Dr. Carroll's experience as well, and in terms of my experience as well, nobody talked about it. So the first time I personally found out about HD was when I was 15, and it was actually a really funny story. So do you know about the TV series House, House MD? Yes. So that's one of the characters in it actually had Huntington's disease. Right. And comparing what I saw there to my own mom, that's how I actually find, found out about HD, what it is, and you know, then sort of figure it out. Then when I approached my family members, you know, is this what it is? And they confirmed it. So there's this real important thing that people, especially elder family members, try to protect children 
practice. Whereas sometimes, you know, that's not the best way to go about things. Absolutely. And that's really one of the first lines that is in, in the book that talking to kids about HD is that we, we do as a family want to be able to protect our children. Um, and I think that that's really important. If, if there was something that we were hiding from them, if there was something that we could protect them from that's not going to happen or we don't want to happen, but HD is in the family. And my guess is that it's, you know, for whoever the child is, is in front of, that person's going to get progressively worse. And then that child is going to have all of those questions. So even though that's our gut instinct to protect a child, I think it would be really helpful to be able to start having that conversation and normalize it for them. And I think somebody yeah, asked about sure. resources. So if you do go on to um, hdo.org, hdyo.org, and look up um, for families or parents, or just in the search, put in talking to kids about HD, you will get information. There's a link. My, my book is right through Amazon Kindle. But if you can't get that, if you're not able to for whatever reason, just even some of the resources at the HDO website can be really helpful for you. There are other books and other organizations. HDSA has information about talking to kids. And then if you are um, with, an organ with a, a clinic or with uh, a healthcare provider that um, knows about Huntington's disease, that's the important part, then hopefully they can help you as well. So hopefully that will help people. Cool. All good information. So there's a bunch of questions coming in. So I think the first one is uh, how do you prepare teenagers for social media? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, it's, it's really, I think the question behind that is that we know that there's a lot of scary information out there. And I think that you need to have an open and honest relationship and, and discussion with them to be able to say, I've told you this information. I know that you're probably going to do what I did, and that's to Google this information and to find out stuff. I want you to know that there's a lot of scary information and information that's not correct that's out there. But I can certainly tell you that there are some websites such as HDO that can give you really good information and that you can go and you can get support from people just like yourself. Even if you are not at a place that you can go to a camp or um, any kind of conference, you might still be able to reach out to somebody. You will, not you still might. You will be able to reach out to somebody who will get back in touch with you to say, do you wanna join the Facebook group? Do you want to join some of these other types of social media where we know that the information is monitored? Um, but, but you know, as, as family members, as parents or guardians, that your children are going to go on and they're going to see a lot of stuff. And I think that if you let them know that in advance um, and let them know that if they do see anything that bothers them or upsets them to please come back to you, then you've opened that door and you know that they will be able to have that conversation with you. Also, I think it's important to go back to say, do you have any questions? Have you looked up anything? I want you to be honest with me. And that could be the person who is, has the gene for HD. It could be a, a well parent or it could be somebody else in the family that that young person has a good relationship with. Um, that could be also helpful. Yeah, all good points. I think the key would, like, as you mentioned, is the open door policy, right? You know, encouraging them to do their own research as well. And if they see something or have questions, then you can come back to the parent as well. Right. I think social media in itself isn't really a bad thing right. because it enables people to connect with a lot of people. And then you can sort of, form that sense of community because right. HD is a very isolating disease I think where yeah. you sometimes feel that you're all alone yeah I think as, as family you can also check in with it with the young person and whether it's a child young adult a teenager young adult just to say you know what information have you looked up so far or what's bothering you the most because we know teenagers are going to say you know nothing's wrong or you know I don't have any questions but if you that's kind of a yes or no but if you say, what, um, what did you find out about Huntington's disease that surprised you the most? What did you, say, what did you find out that you realized that you weren't afraid of? What bothered you the most about the information? That kind of opens the door a little bit more, as you said, to, to have those ongoing conversations. Yeah, and also just one final point on the social media aspect is that it's also a great window into the lives of people already living with HD. Because you, then you can you know, read about their experiences or connect with them. 
I think right. on uh, TikTok, I don't know if you're familiar with the app, there's a great um, person who is living with ju uh, juvenile onset Huntington disease and she chronicles her life and stuff. So it's really you know cool to watch as well. Yes. And I think to let people know, um, to piggyback off of that, that everybody's uh, relationship to HD is different. So just because you do see that, it doesn't mean whether it's somebody with JOHD or somebody with adult onset Huntington's disease, that that doesn't mean that that's going to happen to you or not happen to you. So really do let young people, children, adults, teen, young adults or teens know that everybody with HD is, has a different journey. And I think that that's important to know because there might be some things that you identify with, but then all of a sudden you, a young person might be afraid that something might happen that's similar. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Exactly, I think it's, it's important to frame the conversation that you know, each your experiences are your own. You know, it's great that you're seeing these things and you're connecting with people, but your experiences will absolutely be your own. Yes. All right, I think we're good to move on to the next question. Um, would you discuss the risk of inheriting HD when you have the initial conversation with a younger person, for example, or a kid? Are such good questions. Yeah. You need to know your child the best. You might have a child in your family that just needs to know everything. You might have a child that you know you can just give a little bit of information. But again, I think it's really important that we always joke around that if there's something wrong with technology, you're gonna call your two-year-old or your four-year-old to, to turn on the TV or to do something, that young people are really savvy. And just because you didn't discuss it with them doesn't mean that they don't know it. I can certainly give you multiple examples of young people who have, have you know, come into my office and a family member is like, I'm so nervous, I'm so nervous, especially about the at-risk. And when we finally talk about that, um, all of a sudden the kids are like, yeah, I knew that. And the parents are like, oh my gosh, like, when did you find that out? Well, we found that out like last year or the year before, and it was never discussed. So I think it's important to know your child. There's nothing wrong with saying, I'm going to come back to all of this. Um, and then to be able to say that uh, in a way that makes sense that, you know, there is, if we're talking about, bi you know, non-binary, if we're talking about male and female, so if somebody is non-binary, I, I do apologize, but just in terms of male or female, if we want to use that, that you have is a 50% chance of being born male or female. Now, I know that there are exceptions, so I apologize again, but um, if you want to be able to say that it's like tossing a coin, that inheritance is like tossing a coin, that you don't know if it's going to land on head or tails. I don't know if you're going to be a boy or a girl. Obviously, there's different genes, um, but we're just trying to make analogies that a child can understand, that you can have a family with four boys. You can have a family with two boys and two girls. You can have a family that has three and one, that we just don't know what the what, what's going to happen, what chance is going to give us. So I think that it is important to eventually have that conversation, but you can do that in little stages. However, please do know that most of the time your young person is going on to some type of technology and Googling and finding out about Huntington's disease. And that is what comes up. Yeah, I think HDYO has a very good resource for kids, especially. I don't know if you know it, HDYO Land, yes. which can sort of frame the conversation and parents can sort of go through that journey with them. All right. I don't know if the, Peter that answers your question, but if you have more, let us know. Um, there's another question. Do you think when you first talk to talk to kids about HD in general, should it be sugar coated, or do you just you know recommend keeping it real? Yeah. Well, I mean, it depends on your definition of all those things. Do I think it will be sugar coated in turn? Do I think it should be sugar coated in terms of don't worry, you'll never get this? No, because that to me is a lie. Unless you know, unless there's there's PGD or IVF that you know that this child is not going to get that, or if that child is has a parent, but that child themselves is not at risk, whether they are adopted, whatever the situation is. So don't make promises that you can't keep. Um, don't say, I'm never going to you know, put dad in a nursing home, or I'm never going to do this, or I'm never going to do that, because you just don't know what the future is going to hold. So do I think that you need to sit down and say, um, this is an awful, awful you know, uh, disease? 
No, because that's, that's an, uh, yes, it's an awful disease, but I think that if a child grows up knowing that this is their normal, then it, it's okay. They're going to see the highs and the lows. They're going to have open communication, but I think it's really important, again, to spoon feed information, see if the child can, can digest that information, go back and have another discussion, talk about what is a concern of theirs, and have open conversations. You don't need to go into details about CAG repeats and all these different medications, just to know that this is what we found out, this is what's going to happen, and that there's lots of hope for the future. We all saw a lot of different companies um, who are talking about uh, research that's happening now, not in the future. So I always try to leave as young, young people as well as adults who come to see me with that, that notion that this is hope for the future. We are in a good time right now in terms of treatments that will help um, to, look to, to slow down the progression. Maybe not to reverse it just yet, but to at least slow down the progression of HD. So that's really important to know. So I hope that answers that, that other part in terms of we don't wanna lie, we don't wanna sugarcoat everything, we want to be real, but we don't want to overwhelm a child either. Yeah, I think it's important what you mentioned that, you know, it has to be incremental, right? With age, probably. Because yes. as their worldview increases, so does their understanding of the world around them and their ability to cope with that information. Right. And we don't want to make that a rule of thumb because sometimes there's a six-year-old that I will talk to who you just sit down and it's like, they're an old soul. They, they just, they get it. They understand. Usually it's because it's open communication in the family. And then I sit down with some teenagers and they don't have a clue because it hasn't been discussed in the family or that that's just the way that they operate. So I think that age, like you said, is important, but also knowing your child. Now, when you know your child and say, oh, my child is anxious, I can't discuss this. I don't think that that's sort of your get out of jail free card that you shouldn't discuss it. I think you need to discuss it in a way that is positive, that feels very hopeful for this child. Because if that child's a worrier anyway, they're worrying anyway. So I think that it's really important to have an open discussion with them. Got it. I think uh, we have another question. Uh, just a question about what are your books about and where can we look them up? So I've had some publications. The one book I think that Mustafa was talking about was is called Talking to Kids About Huntington's Disease. I don't think I have a copy. It's not in hard copy anymore. It's just digital, meaning that you would go onto a platform like Amazon Kindle and um, be able to read the book. Um, it's a short, easy to read book. Again, if you don't have access to that, um, and if you forget, it is through HDO, you can go on and you, there's a link directly to Amazon. But I think that, again, there are free resources um, that you can go on to HDO and just look around the site. Look, it says for parents, even though everyone might not be a parent, that's okay. It's just a term that we're using. You could be a caregiver, you could be an aunt or uncle, you could be a friend. Um, but if you look around, you will find resources of, of talking to kids. My book is called Talking to Kids About HD. All right, I think we have a great question. Another one. Um, if, the, if a family is trying to keep their HD status private, for example, for insurance or employment reasons or discrimination reasons even, um, but want to be open with their kids about this, yeah. is there any advice on what age kids can understand or be discerning about privacy? Yes, and, and that, that's a great question. And please know that all of these questions are questions that I have been asked for the two, over the two decades that I have been doing this, 20 years. So that means that you're not alone. It's a great question. Um, the hope would be that if you could talk to your children to say, it's really important that we have this open communication, but sometimes people will um, not, they won't understand this information or you explain discrimination. You can do that in lots of different ways. Um, certainly you can tell, uh, I, had, I had one family who um, uh, was of a Catholic or Christian religion and they talked about Santa Claus, that they said, you know, how sometimes you know that Santa Claus isn't real, uh, but other kids don't know that. So when we talk about that, it's, we don't want it to ruin that for, for children, other children. So in terms of Huntington's disease, 
there might be really good reasons and we can go over those of why I don't want you just to tell everyone about this. But if you have questions or concerns, we'll make sure that there are people that you can openly discuss uh, HD with, or you can certainly come to us. So I think you need to be a little creative because I totally get that. There are some families that it's just all over their social media and that's the way that they roll. And then there are some families that really wanna keep this close to their chest and not talk about it. But I would encourage people to really sit down and explain that to, to young people um, because we do want to make sure that they are connected with somebody that they can reach out to and not feel that it's only their burden. The same issue comes up when there's large families and their cousins who are all talking to each other. And there might be one family member who says, we openly discuss this. And then first cousins say, we never discuss this. These are, these are conversations that really need to happen to say, hey, we talk about this in our family. I can't say that my children aren't gonna talk to your children. I, I, can, I can ask them, but that might be something that you want to have a conversation with family ahead of time to say, this is how we do this. Yeah, for sure. I think that it also goes back to, you know, about one's HD experiences being their own, right? For some people that's easier to talk about where they're just naturally inclined to share example, but for others that might hurt them, for example. Absolutely. Talking about these things. And I see that somebody also did something. I do have like the chat open. I, I don't yeah. see the questions and answers, but somebody was asking about HD professionals. Um, social workers. And I think that that's really a great idea. Now, I think I have a caveat though I want you to think about as well. I think that was from Leslie. So um, it's, it could be very scary, maybe not to, to you. And, and I, I don't know, you know if this is your children or somebody, uh, uh, somebody else's children, or if you're an adult, it could be very scary for a child to go into a place that they don't know why they're going there. So I always suggest that you at least give a child information that, you know, I have this thing that's called Huntington's disease. It's a brain disease. Um, I'm okay right now, but there's going to be a lot of doctors and nurses and social workers and psychologists and people who I'm going to be working with. And I want you at least to meet them. A lot of times in my clinic, what I do is sometimes have a child just come in to meet me, not to be interrogated, meaning not that I'm gonna ask them a whole bunch of questions, but just to get to know who I am. So I take some crayons and I sit on the floor and we draw pictures and that's it. So that they know when they come back to see Dr. Bonnie and talk about Huntington's disease that, um, you know, we're gonna sit and we might draw or we might play with Play-Doh or we might do something that's fun. Um, but that I'm a safe person that they can talk to. So I, I really do suggest that if you do want to bring them in, maybe it's at the end of one of your visits that you're sitting in a waiting area when we go back into clinics um, and that they can just say hello to the HD professional for the first time and then say, remember when you met this person, we're gonna go in and we're gonna talk to them about Huntington's disease. And again, uh, please do know that there are plenty of resources like HDO land through HDO that can really help to just break the ice that way. Got it. Uh, there's one other question. Um, it's absolutely not out of the matter of this conference, Marina, but um, how do you explain the school and classmates uh, of, a ch of a child that, has, that he, she may have HD? Okay, so say that again. Are you saying that the child might have like juvenile onset or is it the- Yeah, family? and they're wondering how you would explain that to a school or classmates. Yeah, yeah, really also a good question. And I think I give you a lot of credit to, to be able to say, I think it's important to bring in that part of, of, of the child's life. So let me start as if it was, we're not talking about juvenile first, because I think that that might help to set the stage. So, um, and as we know that when there is a child or a juvenile onset there, whether they know the parent or not, there, there was a, a parent, another parent uh, who had Huntington's disease. So if there's a, a situation where there is a parent with Huntington's disease who has symptoms first maybe, to be able to first explain to the teacher, even if you don't wanna use the term Huntington's disease, that there is a um, neurological problem. Uh, Dr. Bonnie, Dr. Bonnie, just a quick interruption again. So they're requesting you to please talk slower again, oh, okay. because they're trying to translate for another community. Okay, thank you so Sorry much. Uh, I, I appreciate that. It's something I'm working on very hard. I get really passionate about this. So, yeah, for yeah. sure. 
Yeah, but it's great that we have uh, people in uh, Latin America who are listening in. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that it's really important to be able to bring the uh, community, the child's community in, which also includes the school. So being able to say to an administrator, meaning a principal or somebody in a school that we need to um, let people in the, in the school system know that there is somebody who has a brain disease in the family and that will impact a child. Um, and uh, that that's going to, um, there might be things going on at home that are upsetting. So we need to at least let them know. Um, in terms of juvenile onset of Huntington's disease or pediatric Huntington's disease, again, I think it would be really important to be able to provide information to the school system. Now, in America, we have um, school social workers or psychologists who will work um, to advocate, meaning that they will work to um, to, to pr not protect the child, but to be able to explain to the school system what's going on with the child. So in that situation, it would really be important to bring in some professionals to talk to the school to say, this is what's going on. This is where the child might need some help. And this is where, um, you, know, where you can explain Huntington's disease to other people in, in the school system. Now, when it comes to the, their classmates, um, that, that's also something different and something that if you are open about all of this, the child can be part of. Um, way back when I started, I was asked to give a talk about Huntington's disease for a young woman who was at risk uh, and she was a senior in high school and she did not tell people about Huntington's disease, but for her final project, she wanted to. And I was brought in and I, I told, I talked to the, the whole school, the whole uh, senior class about Huntington's disease. And she stood up and she said, I'm at risk for this disease. So it was really a great way that she was able to get support. So I think that this, again, reaching out to your community to say, how can we help? What information is important for that young person um, to be able to be successful in school? Those are all things that I think could be really helpful even at the very beginning of finding out about Huntington's disease in the family. All right. Um, yeah, so the next question I think is pretty similar to my own experience. Um, so the question is, can we also touch on kids talking to their friends? For example, maybe when their mom is lifting them uh, up from school and showing slip symptoms, which is funny because this is exactly what happened to me where you know, I didn't know how to talk to tell my friends about this. Because uh, whenever my mom used to come to pick me up from school, I would try to get out as quickly as possible. You know, there, as a child, you can, because you don't know exactly what's going on. You know, it's a degenerative brain condition, but you just wish things were normal. So you sort of tend to feel embarrassed, especially in front of friends. So I think that aspect is important to consider as well. Yeah, I, I think absolutely that it's really important that we acknowledge how young people are feeling. And to tell you the truth, how young people are feeling can be really similar to how adults are feeling in the family, but they just don't talk about it. That another adult might feel embarrassed as well. But we've had so many kids who have said, you know, I was picked on or bullied. Even in this conference, we've heard people say that because they said, you know, oh, your dad's always drunk or, um, you know, you can't go over to the person's house because the, the person with HD might, you know, explode, you know, might have a, a tantrum or might be inappropriate. So I think that, again, to know that you're not alone, to have to let that child know that they're not alone and that they can be with other people uh, and, and really have a chance to talk to other people who feel the same way, because that's real. Uh, and I think that if we, if they feel like all of a sudden there's somebody who understands and you don't have to explain Huntington's disease to them, that those are all gonna be things that are really, really helpful to that young child. That young child. Um, also, before I forget, uh, we were talking about uh, Latin America. Um, 2018, I believe, I was asked to do a talk in Puerto Rico on talking to kids about HD. Um, there was a, a, a translator at the time 
who I was having a lot of difficulty with all of the speakers uh, translating in real time. So at lunchtime, for some reason, I was able to take some time and translate my talk, talking to kids about HD using Google Translate, which I'm like thumbs up, into Spanish. So if that person who was translating would like to reach out to me, it's Dr. Bonnie, D-R-B-O-N-N-I-E at hdo.org. Mustafa, if you want to uh, uh, put I'm that in, down. Yep. please do. Reach out to me. I'm happy to give you my slides. Obviously my talk, my, I don't have it recorded and my talk is in English, but just to have the slides might be a huge help for you. Um, I do not believe that the talk was recorded. And if it was, it was um, the, the translator had difficulty, but I think the audience really appreciated being able to see slides in Spanish. And from what I understand, it was pretty close. So please do reach out to me and I will offer those to you. Yeah, so in that sense, this session is being recorded. And I think in a couple of weeks, it'll be up on YouTube where people can use you know, again, Google Translate and the wonders of technology to auto-translate or auto-caption. So at least they'll have subtitles in their own language. And it looks like that this person was from Venezuela. Um, so that might be something that we can work with Factor H to see if there's a way exactly. to, um, to, tr to translate my talk so that some kind of video. So let, let's talk. Please reach out to me and remind me who you are when you contact me. Yeah, for sure. So as we wait for more questions to come in, this is like fantastic to hear about and talk about in general. Um, why don't we next talk about how having an HD affected parent can affect the relationship with the other parent? Yeah, I think- As a child, for example. And then we heard from some young people um, about that feeling that all of a sudden you're, you're a caregiver. And I think it is really important to as a will, what I call will parent. Again, the person with HD does not have to, or the person with a gene does not even have to be symptomatic and things can change in terms of relationships. So I think that it's really important to have an open relationship with, again, what I call the will parent. Again, it does not have to be a mother or a father, parent I'm using very loosely. Um, that to be able to say, you know, if that young person is called on for caregiving, that is a huge burden. Now, I realize that there are some families that don't have any other options, that they really need that person to step up and help. But I think that um, there are a lot of organizations that do focus on young carers and will tell you that that child needs respite, that that child needs a place that they can just be a child. They might actually say to you, oh, no, no, I don't want to go out with my friends or do this. I want to be, I want to help. That, that's an issue as well, because they all of a sudden become what we call parentified, that they become a parent. And it is really important for children to be children and to let them know that you will have an open, honest conversation with them about anything that's going on. You don't need to give details, but overall, and that it is important for them to take time for themselves and to be a kid. So I think that's really important when a lot of times families, um, especially um, females, unfortunately, globally, are called on to be caregivers. Not that males don't or non-binary people don't, but I think it's really important to know that that's a role that a lot of young women are, are forced um, and I use that term lightly, um, forced to, to, to be part of. So I think it's really important in terms of being able to stay to a child. I get it and I will ask for your help, um, but I need you also to focus on your school, which I know is hard when there's other stressors, but let's get you the help that you need so you can talk to people, become educated about HD and get some support. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Yeah, for sure. For example, I was just speaking from personal experience because I was in that situation, right? Where suddenly the caregiving responsibilities were sort of thrust on me, where I had no idea what I was doing most of the time. And I'm glad you brought up the role of women because what ended up happening is like, I didn't want anything to do with it. So I ended up shirking most of my responsibilities. So it ultimately fell on my younger sister who was about a couple of years younger than me. So that's 
it's important to note that as well. Yeah. And sometimes just asking for help, which is such a hard thing to do, but just knowing that there could be some help out there is the first step to be able to say, is there a healthcare provider? Can we talk about what is needed in the home? Um, I know it's hard to do. I know it can be scary to have other people in, but you really have to think about the long run. The same thing with talking to kids or talking to each other about HD. You need to think about what will happen later on. I have to tell you that in the 20 years I have been doing this, I have never had a young person, child, or teen come up to me and say, I wish my family never told me about HD. And I need you to, to know that that's the takeaway message here that no child has ever said to me. I mean, they have said, I wish I didn't have HD in my family. I wish we could cure this. Absolutely, we all do. But I think that it's really important to know that even children who are worried or who have other health issues going on, that nobody has ever said, I, I wish nobody told me about this. Oh yeah, for sure. I think uh, most of the young people I've talked to, I think the feedback is, I wish I had known earlier than when my fam family decided to tell me. Yeah, earlier, more information. We heard from Jeff Carroll that just because you said HD doesn't mean your job is done. You really need to go back and make sure that that child is getting their needs met. And again, that's hard because it might be you who has that gene or the symptoms or the well person in the house. So again, know that there is a community here that you're part of now that, um, that will offer some help and make sure that that child stays connected. But it can be up to you to make those steps happen and to continually go back to say, let's check in, let's see what's happening. Also, and I don't know if there's more questions, but just to be able to know that not every child is going to sit down and have an open conversation. That is okay, especially teenagers are going to maybe shut down. But if you can say, I'm here and I'm happy to have these conversations. And if you say as the adult, I know that a lot of times you might not want to feel like you're, you, you might feel like you're overburdening me you might feel like you are coming to me for everything and you don't want to do that. But I have to let you know that I'd rather we have an open conversation than you worrying and me worrying and me worrying about you and us not talking. So I think it's really important that we have open communication even when there are tough decisions and tough uh, conversations so that we can, um, can, can go through this together. I'm hoping that people will we'll, we'll hear that. Yeah, for sure. I think we have a question, but before we get to it, since we have loads of time, um, I think what's important to also recognize is the sibling aspect of it as well. For example, when I was told about HT, all us, I have three sisters, so all four of us were sat down together and told. So what do you think about that? How do you recommend talking to each person individually are doing it together for all siblings because my youngest sister was I think nine at the time and I was what 14 so you know there's different stages of life and that can affect how differently we process things especially as children right and we touched upon that at the very beginning but I think it's worth really going into in detail that when you talk to children separately um, even at the very beginning then each child doesn't know what the other one has been told and a couple things can happen. Either that child's gonna say, I'm not allowed to, or we don't discuss this, and that's a burden, or they're going to run to each other, especially if they're close, or maybe if they're not, and start talking amongst themselves. So I really think that we come down to the most, what we call a common denominator, the, the, the most basic information to sit everyone down and to say, I, all need, I need you all to know that this is what's going on. Then, like you said, if there's some differences in terms of intellectual ability, other, um, you know, just age, however your child processes, then to be able to go and to draw pictures or to have more detailed information based on how much information they can take in. So I really do suggest to people to have that conversation so that everybody knows that this was discussed and everyone hears what, was, what, what goes on at that discussion. Then there can be that individual discussion uh, later on. I, I absolutely think so. So hopefully that answers that part. Yeah. Got it. Uh, there's a question. 
Um, so it's just any advice for someone who's in their early 20s and a woman or identifies as a woman um, who spent most or all of their teenage years as a carer, but now is out on her own for the first time. I'll let you answer this one and then I'll chime in because I basically this is my exact situation, but I'm a dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I think that you, you really did talk about that a bit. And I think that First of all, you know, thank you for doing what you did. Um, it could not have been easy. And if it sounds like that this person is no longer having to care for that, that person. And I think it's people like that person who wind up like you, Mustafa, that you, you wind up saying, I still, I wanna be in this community and do something for good. Whether that's telling your story of, of if this was forced on or if you wanted to or what you missed out on. Because I think as a young person, you probably feel like you have missed out on things. And to tell you the truth, that that might lead to some anger and you have a right to feel that way. Or it might feel proud and you have a right to feel that way. So I think it's really about getting in touch with um, and talking to somebody about what that felt like of that you were really important or that you were burdened or that you were both and at least um, talking to somebody about those feelings first, then going back and saying, you know, what, what did I miss? You know, what could I have been part of? And do I need to, to find, you know, more friends? HDO is a good place to do that as well. Um, do I need to, um, is there something that I really wanted to do when I was younger and I didn't? Am I able to do that now? So I, I think it's about having a conversation with somebody um, about what that felt like and, you know, and if, if you need to process that, I think now is the time to be able to do that so you can move forward. I'm not saying you're stuck. I'm just saying that there might be some other feelings that you have that you don't even know that you have right now. But talking to somebody about that might really help you. Exactly. That's exactly what I wanted to say as well. I think the take home message is that you're never alone. It's important to definitely talk about your feelings and coming to the specifics of your question, you know, if you're because I left home for the first time at 22 and my mother passed away in 2011, which was about eight, nine years ago. So I was 18 or 17 at the time. So after that, there's a lot of questions that come up because now you suddenly have to transition from a caregiver and sort of try to figure out who you are because your previous role is definitely as a caregiver. And without that person to care for, you're suddenly, you know, at least I felt pretty confused as to, okay, what do I do now? So in that sense, but ultimately, I think the important thing is talking to people and figuring it out and sort of slowly healing and letting go of things. Right. And remember, we can give ourselves definitions. We don't have to, you know, if somebody gives you a definition of a caregiver, you can also be something else. And, and I think that that's really important to say, I, I need to, to figure out what, what I, how I want to define myself or at least start on that path or come to some um, reconciliation, like think about what that meant at the time and can you change that? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, the important thing also is, I think you touched on this as well, you miss out on a lot of things. So after you, know, you get through that process, I went back and you know, sort of explored the things I really wanted to do. Right, right. So I think that COVID is also having, making us miss out on a lot of things. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't mean that you can't do those things later. It doesn't mean that you can't have, um, you know, for some young people, a prom or, um, you know, be around friends or have a special birthday that passed or celebrate something quietly um, with somebody else that you weren't able to during quarantine. So I think you can go back and there's no defining, you know, what that means. I saw on, um, maybe it was some of the social media that there were two brothers who their mother always had these fun birthday parties for them. Maybe somebody else saw it. And in their thirties, they had a construction birthday party uh, with all the balloons and the cake and all kinds of things like they were a child. There's nothing that says you can't do that. So I think it's really important. I think, I think there's another, uh, somebody had a question. Yeah, yeah for sure. And I'll, I'll let you look at that. But please make sure that people out there are taking care of themselves in healthy ways. You really need to think about talking to somebody if you are having difficulty. Please do not use um, things that, addict, that you get addicted to. 
drugs, food, alcohol, buying things, sex. There's lots of things that are, are, are that can be done in a healthy way. And there are things that are uh, unhealthy. And I think it's really important to know that, um, that there are people out there who are willing to help you and that you need to think of good coping ways um, uh, to, you know, to deal with things. So please exactly. know that that's, yeah, I think there's a that's an issue. I think there's a distinction between exploring things and, you know, using them as a coping mechanism for sure. Okay. Yeah. So coming back to the question that is asked, uh, it comes from Venezuela, I think again. So this is Marina de Kaufman. Um, and they ask, how do you help a child or a teenager deal with harassment when it comes from their own community, for example, their own loved ones? And I'm glad they asked this question because I experienced this as well. Um, they say that this is a common problem within their HC clusters in Venezuela. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry that that's happening. It, it really is, is, is heartbreaking. I think this is really um, the Dancing in the Vatican, uh, a message behind that, the, the uh, documentary that Charles Zabin is going to be talking about or um, that you can look up. So Dancing in the Vatican is really about um, a, a world leader who is able to put a name to HD and say it's, it's hidden no more, that, um, that this is not something that um, people should be bullied about or um, that they should be um, in a situation where they're being harassed. One way to deal with that is to um, have, you know, and again, I don't know the situation in Venezuela, but sometimes when I've had children deal with that issue, um, what, what we wind up doing is telling them to make a, a project about Huntington's disease for their school and really getting people involved and say, let me teach you about Huntington's disease. Because I think like any other type of prejudice um, and discrimination and harassment, it's about people not understanding what you're feeling and what you're going through and needing education. So one thing might be, oh, you know, let me tell you about, you know, my mom's disease or let me do a project on Huntington's disease. I get people from all over the world who are contacting me about a school project, um, you know, that they, they, they want information so that they can do this. Sometimes it's about educating people about the disease. So it empowers that young person to say, I wanna tell you about this. Um, that might be one way. Certainly, you know, I know going to the school or going to somebody you think you trust and then not having that person understand or make fun of the child or the family member, um, it can be really, it, it's real. I know it's out there, but, you know, first of all, knowing again, you're not alone. You have a whole community of people who understand what Huntington's disease is so that you don't have to explain that. Finding support and also seeing if there's a way you can turn this around and start educating people about Huntington's disease so that they are aware. Yeah, just piggybacking off that and I have a follow-up question. So what do you do when it's coming from within your own family members, for example? So let's say your extended family, your cousins, your uncles and stuff start, you know, this because there's a tendency for family members to sort of start isolating themselves from the affected family, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's two parts to that. I know we're getting close to, to wrapping up. So one is that there are going to be people in families who no matter what you say, they need to run away. They need to put space in between. And I think it's important to know that if your energy is put into um, trying to get them to understand and help and they can't, that that might not be a good use of your energy, that they might just need to go and not be part of, of, of helping or understanding. And then it is a question of being able to say, are you willing to you know, have a discussion with me about Huntington's disease? Because I'd like to be able to explain it to you and, and offering that. So again, um, really important that if you're waiting for the family or somebody to wake up and help, that's what I call magical thinking. And it might not help. You can ask and you can be direct about that. Or you can say, again, this is, heart this is hurtful. Uh, behavior, it really hurts my feelings. And I'd like you to at least understand a little bit about more about Huntington's disease because it's real. Uh, at least it's something that will try to help empower you. Um, it might not be 100%. And if so, then it might just be not having ongoing conversations with that person about Huntington's disease anymore. Yeah, for sure. I think the biggest barrier is the education and the awareness. So I think the aim is to educate 
and make your family members and your friends and your general society be aware of what HD is. And that way there's you know less of the stigma surrounding it. Yeah, all right. I think we still have uh, about five minutes to go. So let's start wrapping up. So in, do you wanna just summarize what the best way to approach talking to a kid is? And then we'll see if there are any final questions and sure. then we can end. And again, people can reach out to me. The in email is there. I think the first thing that people need to do is to look at their own feelings about HD. How was it discussed with them? Um, you know, what are your feelings about that? You might not even realize that you feel resentful or gra grateful or any of these things. So I think it's important for you yourself to, to talk to somebody. Then you can talk to a child and educate them. I know that it's scary, uh, but it's scary for us. Fears are, are learned for, be, for children. You know, when, when we are afraid of something, it's because someone taught us to be afraid. The children that do grow up in, in the families that, it's, that it is open usually do cope better. I can't tell you 100% of the time, but usually they do. So I think a good take home message is number one, you did not do anything wrong if you haven't discussed this, but now you have a platform where you can say, I, I feel empowered, I can do this. Look for the resources, look for a community, talk to your healthcare providers if somebody is knowledgeable about Huntington's disease and please reach out to us. That's why HDO was created. We wanna grow healthy children and healthy families and you can do that. There's a lot of families that cope really well and walk with this disease and you can strive to be one of them and we can try to help you to do that. All right, for sure. I think let's just wait a minute to see if there are any final questions. Yeah, it's great that people from all over the world are joining us in this Congress. It really, you know, um, shows the worldwide impact of HD in the first place. And, you know, it's also that most of the commons, most of the problems that we have are pretty common. Yeah, ab absolutely. The first time I was asked to speak internationally, I just was like, I, I don't understand. The issues are going to be different. And I gave a talk in Manchester, England years ago, and people from all over the world came up and said, those examples were the examples that I can give you as well. So it was really very amazing how common a lot of these issues are. Everything that was brought up today has been something I have heard from all over, from people from all over the world. And I think that, that just to have that, that united feeling that, that these are thing, issues that go on for so many people can help to normalize this as well. Yeah, for sure. I think a couple of the questions were really specific to my situation as well. And you know, it all comes back to across continents that we're really experiencing some of the same things. And the important takeaway message is that you are never alone. Absolutely. And yeah. there are a lot of comments and I really appreciate the feedback. I appreciate the feedback about the speed of my, my talking and I'm working yeah. on that, so thank you. Yeah. But um, I, I'm, everybody who asks questions, it's really, really helpful. Yeah, for sure. Some really nice feedback coming in. That's great. All right. I think we're good to go. I don't think we have any other questions. So thank you, Dr. Bonnie, again, for the wonderful talk. It was an absolute pleasure. It was really nice you know, seeing you answer these questions and me participating a bit as well. Thank you, Vo. Thank All you, right. everybody. Enjoy the All rest. Uh, for those of you who are still with us, there's a couple of other sessions going on. I think there's a 15 minute break before, but if not on track one, we have Kathy who will be sharing her experience of HD. And on track two, you will get a panel on how people, the experiences of people who have participated in HD research. All right. Uh, yeah, there is definitely a 15 minute break. And after that break, It'll be these two sessions. All right, thank you everyone. It was a wonderful interactive session and I hope you have a nice rest of the evening and ca catch some great talks.